Hi, I'm Dave Barnes. And I'm John McLaughlin. And welcome to Dadville. Dadville is a podcast where we talk about life, love, and the pursuit of awesome dadding. It's funny thoughts and deep talks. So please, enjoy your time here in Dadville and enjoy this episode with... Very Deep. Hey, Dave. Dave, shoot, John. Yeah. Dad coming. It. It's okay. No, You're nervous. He, I am. Hey, I got a big question for you. Not to okay. make you more nervous, but I'm Shit. I'm talking like huge question. Okay. Okay. Let me. Uh, okay. I'm ready. I'm ready right you now. You ready? Yes. Okay. I'm going on tour this fall. <clears throat> well, you are. My, you're nervous. I got to get my voice. A little puberty <laughs> flashback there. Okay, go ahead. I need a podcast recommendation. Oh, okay. That's huge. Oh, that's a biggie. Um, have you checked out the Imagine Faith Talk Pod on That Sounds Fun Network? Oh, go on. I have Okay, okay. I, hear more. I was going to. You interrupted. I'll set it up like this, okay? What if two men on different paths, an ex-male exotic dancer turned life coach and a pre-med student turned musician, came together with the same realization that you don't have to sell your soul to obtain your dreams? Oh. And that the key to unlocking everything you've been dreaming of was found through faith in God. Am I am I on the right path? No, I, well, I'm listening. Okay, I'm picking I'm up in. everything you're putting down. I'm in. Let me, let me finish that. You, you kind of keep interrupting. Okay, but I'm subscribing. Right, hang on. Okay. Right now. No, okay. Done. I saw you do it. Episodes are hosted by Kevin Olusola, beatboxer of three-time Grammy Award winning Multi platinum selling acapella quintet pentatonics and what author, a life, Jeez. thank you. I'm just making this up on the fly. <laughs> and author, life coach, and entrepreneur Donovan D. Donnell. Okay, well, did you know this? That through each deep dive into the Bible, they discover how to maximize uniqueness, weaponize the imagination, Ooh. and leverage faith in God for success. Okay. The hope is simple to find the tools to optimize your performance through partnership with God. Wow, you know what? For a new subscriber, you just nailed that. Job. I did. I you did. And episodes come out every Wednesday wherever you download your podcast. Imagine Faith Podcast. Man, that was good. Hey, y'all. It's Dave from Dadville. Hopefully by now you know that Dadville is a wonderful, fun side gig for John and I as we're both actually singer-songwriters in our real life here in Nashville. And speaking of singer-songwriter, I want to tell y'all about my latest release, Remembering Greatest Hits Acoustic. Over the last few months, I've been releasing some of my favorite songs I've ever recorded, and you can hear them all right now. That's literally right now. It has been so fun hearing these stripped down acoustic versions of songs that people know and love. These are the songs that helped me build my career and I'm so excited to share them with y'all in a new way. So if you can and you will and you want to, go check out Remembering Greatest Hits Acoustic available now. So I, I don't know, so we're starting right now, by the way. I'm okay. so excited. All right. I'm so okay, everybody's gotta be professional. So Barry, I'm gonna I tell you something you might not believe, but this is true. You have been the most requested guest. That makes no sense. I'm telling you, you're not going to believe me, but I this don't. is true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had uh, someone today, literally today, sent me a message on Twitter or Instagram and said, hey, you guys got to have Barry Dean on. Wow. True story. And then it was from your account. And it then there was, was another one. The real Barry Dean. <laughs> the real Barry it was. Dean, yeah. it was. <laughs> and yeah. then um, we had, I've had like, you know. Sadly, this was this guy. I'm going to expose. I'm, I'm sort of going to this the truth this quickly. You've had like two or three requests, which means, <laughs> but still. But relatively But speaking, relative to others, yeah. that is two or three more than really anybody else. Um, no, well, but it's. Me, Jen, my wife. And, yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah. kidding. Yeah. Barry, this is the truth. Like people have literally, like, it's so interesting to me that I, I'm like, isn't it? I'm very old. You must have, well, you just have reach. I'm like, man, who knew? There's just my a lot of expectations out there. That's right. Yeah, I'm feeling episode. that. You know exactly to speak my language. Um, so so, I, I, so we are super duper thrilled you're on here. Yes. Um, so um, you, I don't care if it's a lie, Barry. You said you listen to the podcast and so yes. you know it's about to happen. Um, yeah. This is our brag sheet. And I, I had to do oh. editing here. Now, my wife said to me a few minutes ago before yeah. I walked in, she said, did you send him a bio or any information? And I said, why would I send him that? He knows me. She was like, but he may want to say it. And I, so I'm I did it. not send no, it. No, that's what I'm, that's what's oh, happening right boy, now. I can't wait Buckle to up. hear okay. what, you, Make now, up some things. Okay. Need to. Um, so this is, this is, uh, this is your life. Uh, Barry, oh, I'm just going to read it because it's actually a really well-written thing. So oh, Barry Dean takes nothing for granted. Isn't no, he doesn't. Who okay. said that? Nope. Even, 
Who said that? <laughs> Who said that? Uh, <laughs> I like that idea, though. I want to live up to yeah. that, right? Yeah. Listen, what, <laughs> what, what are bios except for aspirational, yeah. for all being honest? It's what we're shooting for, right? It's not the truth. It's what could be. Um, <laughs> yeah. Man, that's going to make me laugh. I feel like, feel like my favorite person at the office. Did you say the thing about nothing for granted? Because that's a really good point. Gosh, I should beautiful. take nothing for granted. Okay, uh, even after earning a Grammy nomination for Tim McGraw's Diamond Rings and Old Barstools and topping charts with four number one singles, he remains awestruck each time he hears a song you write on the radio. I feel that way, too. Um, Dean can still, Dean, that's such a baseball name, can, uh, still can't help but think of how he seemed destined. There's so much this I want to talk about, by the way. To work a nine to five in Kansas, a faith that now seems preposterous, Ooh. given his track mm. record, which is punny. Two number one singles for Little Big Town, Pontoon, and Day Drinking, which are yeah. jams. Yeah. Bops, as the kids say. Think a little less, <laughs> which uh, topped the charts for Michael Ray. Headache Medication, which most recently hit number one for John Party. Ingrid Michaelson's Top 40 Smash Girls Chase Boys. And an ever-growing list of country. Isn't it great? Oh, I um, want to talk about that. I want to talk okay. about that chorus. Yeah. yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. Still be yes. it's, it's all the Pokemon all the in the rules. West End beat. Yeah. Gosh. So good. <laughs> You jerk. <laughs> An ever-growing list of country and pop successes proved Dean is doing exactly what he was made to do. Here's the other thing I want to go back, because I, I did a little compilation of a couple of bios. Um, the other thing, there's some really, this is one of my favorite things I've ever read. Okay. His first songwriting cut was Reba uh, McIntyre playing uh, Moving Alita, which That's is right. a beautiful song. Personal song Dean wrote based on his grandmother's love for his spouse. She went through Alzheimer's, which is amazing. This mm. is one of my favorite things I've ever read. Next it says, his first single, <laughs> Martina McBride's God's Will, was also personal, written in response to his daughter's premature birth. Mm -hmm. Rolling Stone included, do you know this? No. God's Will on the list of the saddest country oh. songs of all time. I'm so on. I, I saw I, I that, and I was that. like, yeah. what a... Top 40. Huh? What a <laughs> Top 40 saddest songs. I was like, yes. That is a, what a interesting... I just want to be included. Well, yeah. here's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Listen, You're in here's the, the thing is that that is saying like... <laughs> to be on the country saddest <laughs> list is like being on the heavy metalist most metal. Do you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like yeah. the genre is came up. <laughs> it's a sadness. baked in part of the genre anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah, really you gotta be that bullseye. Sad. Right. If you think of all the sad songs, that was that was pretty exciting. Really, it's a just, bullseye right. within you're a bullseye. Nailing, you're nailing. <laughs> yes, that is exactly the joke I was about to say. Yeah. Literally, I mean, I, I just I giggled like I was reading this bio and I was like, saddest, saddest country, country songs. Song. Well, <laughs> there's plenty of choices there. But is there a party that sort of goes, yeah, I nailed that? That's exactly what we were <laughs> going for. A, no, it's a. I'm grateful, but it's also kind of funny where you kind of go, oh, because there's a twist in that. I don't know if I should say this, but I wrote with Tom Douglas, oh, and, God, uh, no and that was there. our first song we ever. That wrote. is a power duo well he's the power i was new i was the new guy and um we, he's the power <laughs> you make it the duo i was just typing yes sir yes sir what would you say what do you think sir you know i couldn't even call him tom yet sir. mr douglas do you feel mr, <laughs> mr. Douglas? tom yes. douglas mr tom douglas. That, <laughs> that was when you got comfortable mr yeah. tom douglas is there anything that would kill the creative vibe in a co-write if you just kept talking <laughs> saying sir to the, to the sir. Person. Yes, sir. Yes, if you sir. just keep saying that. And, you know, like Jaron writes with Tom, and he has no problem with that. He'll oh, just yeah. laugh right at, you know, mm -hmm. but but I'm still pretty, uh, I think everybody knows, pretty deferential to Mr. Douglas. Oh, my uh, gosh. I call him the maestro most of the time. Yes. Maestro, yeah. You know, it's easier because yeah. you go, I'm at respect, but it, I don't and know. And he's got, for people who are listening who don't know about Tom Douglas, mm -hmm. um, he's just, he's like, He's he's one of the goats of Nashville yeah, he is. songwriting, but he's got that special that's on yeah. Peacock or yeah or Hulu. I can't oh, remember. Yeah, yeah one of one of those that's about songwriting. Love that is just, Tom. It's called Love. Anybody Tom. listening, if you like, even if you don't like, if you aren't a songwriter, but you just like music, it is an it's, incredible thing. You know, I've known him a while, and um, he sent me a rough edit of that. And I, it was during the lockdown, and I remember just calling him and uh, becoming very emotional, talking mm -hmm. to him, saying, "You've made something here with this team, you know, that is, uh, it's, it's really art. It's really beautiful. Yeah. It's and so cool. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't edit it. Don't tweak yeah. it. Don't yeah. turn it into. It is what it's supposed to be. Just if I could throw my body in front of it and go, this is yeah. so precious. Yeah. Because it's very, you know, I loved his talk at the Hall of Fame. Oh, my gosh. There's a speech out there somewhere, I think, on YouTube of his commencement speech yep. at MBA. He, he's known for these kinds of things. But, but this was a moment where 
visually and and mm. and the editing and the way they told the story was the best presentation of of kind of distillation of Tom's yeah. life work yeah. in a way, I think. This is the documentary you're talking about? Yeah, it's kind of this documentary of how he comes to be a songwriter, but he's talking to, much like his speech at, at the Hall of Fame, he's talking to the young writer who says, I'm heartbroken, it's not going the way I think, why do I do this, what should I mm -hmm. do? And he's answering that question in the documentary and doing it um, at, at its, like, it's, it's Tom at... Uh, Ten, uh, fifteen on a one to ten, just yeah. like uh -huh. perfectly yeah. hewn into yeah. this. Th it just, it just cuts you wherever you live. That. It's really that sounds like it. something I you know need to watch weekly. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It sort of does the, in some ways, the opposite of what he's trying to do because you're so impressed with how good he is, you actually end up back at like, why am I doing? <laughs> why this? am I doing this? Right, exactly. <laughs> it does mean? do that. Yeah, you need to make it. Le throw yeah. some more ums. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> drop your notes. Yeah, Well, in Tom's methodology, Tom is an an interviewer in a way yeah. in a co-writer yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and but he if you try to turn it on him he's normally one who doesn't talk a lot about himself he's yeah. not a person who does that he's the person who's asking yeah. not the person who's answering yeah. i've tried it and sometimes oh. he'll grin at me like i'm sorry i don't think you understand our this is roles the dynamic. and <laughs> he's like i'm mr douglas, <laughs> I'm mr. Well, look, douglas ironically too. i feel like you have done this so far in this interview i was <laughs> gonna say <"Dad, laughs> don't talk about you Dad man come it there okay so much. so back to here's here's the other things i mean it's just a lot of it's a lot of freaking songs being recorded i mean look at this list of people jason aldean that, you don't have to charlotte church <laughs> billy currington brett eldridge hunter hayes toby keith allison kraus that is that is a cut awesome. I really envy. Yeah. That would be so cool to have her sing a song. Rap, Reba McIntyre, Jake Owen, Thomas Rhett, Leanne Rhymes, Carrie Underwood, John Party, Brothers Osborne, Laura McKinnon, Maren Morris, you name it. A ton of that's people. That's, that's all of them. So that's, here, that's here, is, here is something that I think is – you have a, a lot of things that are really interesting about you. Uh, one of the things that's, that's the it's, first time that's been said, so <laughs> go right yeah, ahead. Yeah. Very excited. I can't yes. – I'm going to take notes. Um me. I think one of the things so interesting we're talking about, Tom, is that you guys have a similarity in this in that you had come up doing one thing for a while occupationally. Yeah. And, and like you were living in Kansas. Mm -hmm. You're in sort of like technology world. Yeah, education. Is that where you're from originally? Yeah, I, I was born in Oklahoma but raised in a little town called Pittsburgh, Kansas. And okay. like 18,000 people. And you know who's from there? Jin Schott. Oh, I know. Uh, is from I there. Jen. My wife and Jin Schott cheerleaded together. Wow. And Jin Schott cheerleaded. Cheer led. They cheer led. Have <laughs> we fully avatar? We, we finally have become one person. <laughs> we have. We didn't just say the same thing. We said it at exactly same the same time. time. In the same it pace. was stereo for me because you're I visually and audio auditorily, uh, however yeah. you say that, it was this way. You know, both leaned in, cheer led. Yeah. And uh, and then her father was a an instructor and taught me when I was young. So oh, cool. so yeah. What was it like growing up in Pittsburgh? But not that Pittsburgh. That that's a thing that <laughs> very stays different. with you. Yeah, Does it just have different. an asterisk on the city sign? <laughs> <laughs> it well, doesn't they even say, explain. Just has it up there. We always say we're a sister city, but we don't have the H. So I've always assumed oh, we didn't have okay. enough people, you know, to get the. Like I'm sorry, <laughs> we can be sister cities, but every time they do the census, it's like <laughs> almost uh, an H. If you time. guys can get to 20k, we will give you. An <laughs> we will push it. I think that's about right. people who like who went to Samford. University. Oh, that's it's kind of a similar that's experience tough. where it's like really you're tough. always spelling, Dang, yeah. and you got to be like, I think you no, it's Samford. Samford. Nothing against Samford. It's great school. <laughs> I think you thought I said Stanford. It's it's Havard. We don't have an R. Um, so. <laughs> Havard. <laughs> okay, yeah. so you grew up in Pittsburgh. I grew up Kansas. there, a little town. And um, you, w what's it like? It's a uh, it's a football town, and uh, it was. Uh, it kind of grew from strip mining, uh, so uh -huh. now we have lovely uh, ponds everywhere. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what's okay. left. <laughs> okay. That's what's left. People are like, oh my gosh, it's hilly. Is it the foothills of the Ozarks? No, no, that was strip mining. And um, but uh, yeah, so it was a, it was a small town. My parents had moved there, and my my dad was gonna he 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 taught, did work at the university there for a bit, and then he started a little company. He and my mom with a couple of other people put 50 bucks in and started a company to serve teachers and their students. Specifically back then, like in industrial arts, I don't know if that's before your time, but you know, woodworking and leather craft mm. and all those things. So yeah. Yeah, servicing that, and then that moved into technology education, which became sort of applied physics, which is now called STEM or STEAM. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So he was really early in that. Wow. And, and so that's, uh, so he started that 
with your mom and some other friends. Yeah, there was yeah there was three teachers my my dad and two other teachers. The the other two teachers were going to write a book uh -huh. about some ideas to help in the classroom. And this was I mean I was very little when this happened, and so uh, little boy. And uh, did he leave his like did he stop being a professor? After, to do this? After a, a, a short while, he did. And um, the other two went back to teaching. Uh, business was too stressful and too risky. Uh -huh. And uh, he and mom took it on and, uh, and you know, just worked all the time. I mean, mm, they just yeah. worked. It was just a really hard road. And, and they had both come from rural Oklahoma and uh, from wonderful families, but, but no money or, you yeah. know, I mean, they came from, you know, tough, tough backgrounds. And mm. then... Uh, found their way there and found their way into starting this company and and they ho owned that company for 50 years in the end. Wow! So st the statistical percentage of companies that last 50 years right. is so small, and for them to have owned it uh, for 50 years and Whoa. they just sold it a year ago. What is the on the list of like companies that have lasted 50 years, but yeah. a, but also who were founded by a married couple, who yeah. <laughs> and then that lasted. Yeah, that I mean lasted, that is yeah. that's a short list probably. they're you know they're uh, they work as uh, as a team frankly mm -hmm. um and mm -hmm. you know it was a it was a i didn't understand what they were doing I, I wish i could say that i did i i was the firstborn so i think i competed with the company a lot i didn't oh yeah you know i felt like it my dad was uh, gone a lot he mm -hmm. was working he was driving literally from school to school across mm -hmm. the country building uh, a brand you know, yeah. basically, we don't we didn't call it that. He was just trying to serve teachers and students. Even as they were leaving the company and selling it, he still wouldn't let people talk about sales internally. He didn't want to hear numbers of dollars. He wanted to hear number of students served, Jeez. number of teachers served. He really was missional and cause oriented, and mom was too. And um, and and I would say this that that probably is something that is we're different, but there's a similarity in the way Jen and I work. You know, because mm -hmm. we do sort of work. We we do work as a team, and there's this great uh, illustrator, artist, and book children's book author named Oliver Jeffers. I love him. I love Oliver Jeffers. He just posted something the other day about how everyone always thinks Oliver does everything, mm. and he's like, my wife and I are. We work as a team, not separately. Wow. And, and and there's nothing wrong with people who do it the other mm -hmm. way. Um, but he was like, you know, uh, maybe his father-in-law said this, but he he was saying she, you know, she's making the snowballs. I'm just throwing them. Wow. Mm. And I think there's a lot of that in my You know who's, who was like that surprised me was Jim Gaffigan. Mm, is that right? H yeah. His, oh, wife, yeah. his wife writes is, a lot of his jokes yeah. with him. He's right inside that mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I mean, so like, anyway, that's probably more than you. But but it was a, it was a case where, you know, we we spent a lot of time at the office and um, – yeah. And it was a, it was, you know, it was a different world then. Were right? you, were you into music early or when, mm -hmm. when did that? So you my mom was a piano teacher and everything like that. She wouldn't teach me cause I was such a horrible student. And, uh, but I, I took piano and played saxophone and I never learned guitar cause I was whiny and not disciplined. And then, um, <laughs> then some, that's actually exactly why I learned <laughs> that's, You're actually <laughs> primed for it. Yeah. 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 You should pick it. Yeah. I should have. I, I have now, you know, have I, you yeah, seen I can Kurt defend. Cobain's work at all? <laughs> right when i found open tunings in my 30s i was like wait a oh, minute oh, what? here's your door in. yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm sorry what? it's so we're the same i i played piano all my life but i played saxophone yeah and then later in life picked up the guitar now i can play a little bit of guitar. well and guitar players tend to especially electric players love saxophone yeah really they study coltrane and they study all that kind of yeah stuff. what's so the reason for the overlap Parker, charlie there. parker Lots of notes, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> <Too many laughs> notes but, but but no, they're always trying to find phrasing that magic. You know, there's a magic phrasing. There's a magic right. set of a scale right. that will open it up, right? Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. So that's and that's why Schott's dad was the college teacher of saxophone. And oh, so, and that's mm. so, so. Where yeah. did you go to college? I went to college at little Pittsburgh State University, that little college. Oh, wow. but I don't and have that's a where degree. They, they worked. No, the, um, Dad had a job there when he first moved up there, but only for a few years. And then they worked at this little company called Pitsco, uh, Pittsburgh Industrial Teachers Service Company. And then that became, uh, they had divisions. They had a printing division and then a thing called Jeez. So this is, a, they, they built this like, is a like an operation. Big company. They, they, yeah, I think uh, when I went, you know, I said I would never, I, I worked there as a kid. I, so I swept floors and mm -hmm. packaged orders and all that stuff. But then when I got to be, uh, I kind of got the, 
this idea that I wanted to be a producer or a songwriter when I was probably uh, seventh or eighth grade. But there oh, was wow. no, there was no rock and roll allowed in the house. I mean, it was really you could have Billy Graham's fave, like you could have like Johnny Cash because they're friends. Okay, and okay. you could have Elvis because he did the four gospel right. records, and my dad loves those. And uh, Olivia Newton John just passed, so we mm-hmm, could we yeah. could have Olivia Newton John, but not like physical. Physical. So this would enough. have been like, have you ever never been mellow or whatever. yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, era. Yeah, yeah. Very, I, I love you. You know, real yeah, soft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave. 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 No, that was good. We oh, had I, th- a, I, I thought, didn't thought we were going to go one more oh, phrase. <laughs> Sorry, that's my bad. I, okay. I got nervous and sort of hung it up quick. John, <laughs> don't you just love yes. a nice late oh. summer bike ride around the hood? Oh, my gosh. You know I do, Dave. But you know what I love even more? Tell me. Is riding my electric e-bike, uh-huh. a.k.a. not worrying about pedaling. <laughs> Sometimes you're riding your bike and you're uh, pedaling and you're like, I want to keep riding the bike, but I don't want to pedal anymore. Let me tell you one thing I want to stop worrying please, about. Please. Pedaling. I just don't want to pedal. I don't want to worry about that. I have enough stuff. Go- you make yeah. a great point, John. What is your favorite route or route? I'll tell you what. Okay. The other day, mm-hmm. I uh, it was a Sunday morning, actually, mm-hmm. and I, I went on a little bike ride. Oh. I had a little coffee oh. in my hand. And let me tell you what risky, was so great risky. about that. Yep. It's risky on a regular bike, but on my electric Say e-bike, it. Tell him, John. I didn't have to pedal, so I'm not spilling any Gosh. coffee. You can dedicate your pedaling brain energy to my coffee holding energy. <laughs> Gosh, guys. <laughs> uh, listen, I want to tell you something else, okay? Electric e-bike is the fastest growing e-bike company in the U.S., and it's easy to see why. Yeah. Electric e-bikes are affordable, customizable, and ship free, fully assembled. It's like getting a baby. They're just ready to go. They're ready to you go. You don't have to Boom. put them together, okay? Yep. Plus, they quickly fold in half. No bike rack or truck required. And, Dave, they're surprisingly affordable, mm. starting at just $7.99. $2,000. What? <laughs> Right? What? I know. How's this company even doing it? <laughs> That's way less than the competition. Plus, they are adjustable and customizable. I know you said that, but I wanted to say it yeah, again. Please. And they're so comfortable, even for people who don't normally ride bikes. And you know what, John? If what? You, you know me. I, I, I love comfort. I can't get away from it. You love I That's love like it. your thing. It is. Yeah. It is. Let me, hey, let me ask you something. Okay. Can you guess how long you can ride an electric e-bike on a single charge? What's your guess? <sighs> Seven feet. 20 feet. I'll give you another guess. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, 68 kilometers. No. Uh, wait. 2.5 Rhode Islands. That's a good you guess. always guess 2.5 Rhode Islands. That's, That's close. <laughs> you can cover up to 45 what? miles at up to 28 no. miles per hour on just a four to six hour charge. Listen, that will get me to the church on Cumberland Road for sure. For sure. That's what I did there. Now, where will your e-bike adventures take mm-hmm. you, people? Go to electricebikes.com and get $100 off. Any e-bike purchase. That's L-E-C-T-R-I-C, ebikes.com. So when you were growing up, did you have a sense of like, okay, so I'm going to wear out Johnny Cash and Elvis because that's yeah. that's the closest I'm getting to like Anything you could outside. get. Yeah. yeah. So you, you mostly you're hearing. My mother liked jazz. I remember when, because I'm much older than you guys. I remember when Billy Joel's 52nd Street came out. Mm-hmm. And I was, they would let me buy it because I told him it was jazz because he was holding a trumpet. <laughs> oh jazz, my jazz was gosh. fine. Jazz wouldn't corrupt just anyone. Like yeah. Drew in a trumpet. Yeah. Well, he's holding cover. on the cover of the <laughs> the trumpet. He doesn't play the trumpet. But he's holding one. I was like, yeah. jazz. And uh, so, <laughs> jazz could be jazz. Surely he played some jazz. There's fest some, at some jazz point. in, in this. New stuff. Orleans. You know. Yeah. There's yeah. a horn. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't. So yeah, I, I rock and roll was kind of contraband. You were supposed to do music at church. You know that right. kind of a thing. And so. So what happened in seventh and eighth grade? What was the thing you heard or saw that made you want to? Well, I, it? I heard, I found out there was Christian. W- well, my joke is that I had a Christian rock band in high school that was neither, <laughs> and <laughs> which is true. <laughs> it's so painfully true. We were just like the theology was bad, and the and we didn't rock. And um, but we were trying. The theology and the rock were bad. Both were bad. <laughs> and um, the two but, things you were bringing to the table. And the saddest part is we were absolutely. 110% in. You, know? you have yeah. to be. You can't pretend you What was the name of the band? Heartmender. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. That actually sounds pretty <laughs> intense. Oh, we had T-shirts and uh, all of that. And opened for, well, I can't believe we're telling this story. Uh, opened for Joe English. Joe English was the drummer for Wings for a while. Okay. And then he left and had a Christian rock band. Oh, I kind of know about And then this. he played in a band after Petra. That singer did a band called Pieces of Eight. And so um, we opened for him uh, in Minot, North Dakota, as an example. Mm-hmm. And uh, our band opened for that band. John Lowry, who later ends up in Petra, was in it. George Cascini was in it. Jeez. There were people in that band that became session people here the crazy part of the story is wait not and not in your band you're saying the other band in the other band yeah no, not my band i my was band. gonna be amazed if you're like my we band, were kind of a big deal no we were not a big deal and um but i'm gonna say it was less than two years ago uh we were sitting and visiting with tom douglas and me and some others and he starts telling a story about his first trip to and i know this is not a tom douglas talk but why not? Um, his first time through in Nashville, when he didn't kind of feel like he succeeded, and then he goes to Texas, and then he comes back as the Tom mm-hmm. Douglas. Um, <laughs> as the Tom, as the Tom Douglas. Before it was the. As yeah. Sir. Yes, sir. Before sir. he was sir Tom the, Douglas. Yeah. Yeah. He was the Tom Douglas, then he came back the, the Tom, Tom Douglas. Douglas. That's right. And Big so difference. on that tri- that first round, he became a road manager for Joe English. Wow. And we realized that we probably <gasps> were there no together. Way. We just no. didn't know each other, but... Two so legends crazy. of country we songwriting. Did, but we both ended up in a very cold place uh, with this show. And So anyway... And you were playing piano? I played piano, yeah. Did you yeah. write songs then? I wrote kind of, yeah. I wrote some bad songs. And then I did some music like when I was... I came out of high school and... Um, I, I didn't ever graduate from college. This is something I'm very embarrassed about, but know. it's true. And um, though in my lifetime now I have like way too many hours, but I'm lacking. <laughs> I need to go back for a semester and do like algebra, lifetime fitness. I'm not kidding you. Lifetime I've been a grad fitness. assistant twice at Colorado State, even though I don't have a graduate degree. Really? Yeah. And so I Do mean, they give out honorary high school diplomas? Surely you've yeah, got yeah, like a I cafeteria got, named after you or something. No, <laughs> no. I, they, that's not how that worked. And uh, so anyway, I, I did make a couple of recordings, uh, maybe I'm 18, of a couple of Christian songs. And while I'm there, I had a girlfriend. I made a pop version of one of the songs you know how to write maybe not uh you guys have integrity and so i wrote like <laughs> two lyrics to the thing and the christian radio station wouldn't play it um in our little area and in joplin and um but then through the weather person at the big rock station that got on pop radio and it did a couple it did a lot of things it made me go it was crazy the reaction and all of a sudden i'm writing pop music and this is a big problem, right? In our the way I grew up was kind of a, you know. Th- yeah, that's th- not allowed in the house. Yeah, Dancing with the devil. you can't even bring your own record home. Tomorrow. Right. I mean, Petra and Sweet Comfort Band were pretty radical. You know, White Hearts pretty sketchy. Uh-huh. And uh, so you're certainly if you're over there on the wide way. Yeah. And so then, uh, <laughs> the so then I went to uh, Los Angeles uh, when I was pretty young. Probably no t- way. I went to Tulsa first and worked in the studios there. Cause Tol- that is a well-worn path, by the way. Tol- yeah. Tulsa right out to LA. <laughs> yep. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Well, so many people from where I'm from, and maybe it's true everywhere, they'll say, I'm getting out of this town. And they'll either go to Kansas City or Overland Park, like 90 minutes away, or they'll go to Tulsa, which is what I did, yeah. which is 90 minutes away. And um, you're like, so close. And yet, no. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I see where you're going with get out of this town, <laughs> but I don't understand how being I'm going to get out of this town. Technically. Technically. Yeah. I'm going to go to Springfield, Missouri. What are you doing over there? Well, I'm going to do anime. And you're like, <laughs> oh, you know, I'm not sure. I'm going to be a runway model. And well, it's just like, you're so close. But, um, well, I did so the same close. thing. I, I mocked myself. I'm going to deep sea fish yeah, living so, in Phoenix. <laughs> so I saw what my wife sent to be my bio. And one of the things she put in it to catch me was that I played for an Elvis impersonator in Tulsa, Oklahoma. True story. What? And um, so he, his slogan was the greatest singer since Elvis. And most people don't know this. I can't believe I'm telling you this. But uh, I went to Tulsa and I worked in those studios, jingles and things like that. And um, How old were you? 19 probably. Oh, wow. Something like that. 18, 19. And so you had the bug. Yo, badly. Music yeah. was in. Yeah, yeah like I wanted, you know, if you, again, uh, one time Trent Dabbs and I were driving back on a long road trip in the middle of the night and he decided to play uh, 80s trivia. He had Spotify early. 
And so he would start them to see how long it took me to identify. And, and uh-huh. <laughs> it was, I'm pretty good at that game. Wow. Yeah. Now you hit a certain era. Yeah. Right, and I'm yeah, the right, worst. Yeah, but you, yeah. you get but that anything, little, yeah. You start around 80 and, and end in the 90s sometime, and I can probably, one snare hit, I can probably do Wow. It. Yeah, I can do it off a of reverb. So, so you were, you were like, you oh, loved yeah. music. You I love music, it. and I wanted to do it. So when you're out with the Elvis impersonator, how yeah. many shows are we talking here? Are we, you on the road? We, we never played a live show. He had already played a bunch, and we were supposed to play Vegas, but he was making records in oh, Tulsa, okay. recutting Elvis yeah. songs. Yeah. So you were learning, and I played sax, uh-huh. And I had like a synth stack. So I would do the chimes and the strings and the sax parts and the up a dollars and those kinds wait, of things. Wait, 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 wait. The what? The up, up a dollar, up a dollar. Oh my God. So you learn. Yeah, you had up-a-dollar. to. And he'd be like, oh, when I say it, I'll need. And ching, 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 ching. You know, you just do that little. Because he had a real piano player. He had a band. He had this oil guy who was backing him. It was completely whack. And um, after a little bit, uh, I just realized this was <laughs> not. So then, but then you go to you do go to L.A. I did go to L.A. Yeah. And how long were you there? Less than a year. And uh, doing trying to do music and stuff. Yeah, and it wasn't bad. I mean, it was. I don't have a bad story there. Um, I did run out of brave, you know, but that wasn't <laughs> anybody's fault, you know. I, I had a, I had a counselor once uh, who kind of really saved me in my uh, 30s, and he said creativity is just an act of courage that was mm. his phrase man and so yeah. when i look Good back word. at I see that. at that guy uh, me in la uh, literally barney's beanery uh yeah. thanksgiving morning i went there and had a bowl of chili for my third lunch. street promenade the one uh, in west ho west hollywood yeah and uh so i was sitting there haven't been back but i drive by it when i'm in la and mm-hmm. i was call one of my kid, my son and say guess where i am and they'll say no <laughs> don't quit till you're winning and because uh, it it really was a case where and the world has changed and my parents have changed I mean, you know my dad's a big fan of clapton unplugged and uh-huh. you know it's, it's nothing like it was but in that era it's kind of hard for everybody to figure that out but it was really seen as a really scary thing to go off and go yeah. into the rock and pop yeah. world. Right. And that was secular as compared to religious. And it was, so it created a real divide. And um, so did you go into it sort of like on guard, you know? No. Like I you're going into the <laughs> well, den. No, it was more like I wanted to be there. That's where uh-huh. I wanted to be. Wh- what was what was the pop that was happening in L.A. at that time? Oh, that would have been... Um, <laughs> well, you, Petty was starting to break. I mean, Full Moon Fever comes out oh, okay. before I leave. And uh, um, I'm trying to think of what else. Scritty Politti. And it was, no, it was after Scritty. But like Rick Astley's okay. on out okay. there. Prince's okay. uh, Sign of the Times had already happened, but Love Sexy hadn't happened yet. Black Album happened. Mm-hmm. Prince's Black Album. Um, Bad is out, mm-hmm. but Dangerous is not. So, yep. so it's right in there, late 80s. And. Um, or mid to late 80s, probably 88. Something okay. Like that. And um, and I went out, and frankly, you know, I, w- I went to Dick Grove School of Music for a while and uh, met some people and recorded some things and had some meetings, and they went well. And um, this will sound crazy, but that probably created more pressure in me than um, – than failing. I was kind of prepared for rejection. And then it mm. kind of worked. Yeah, because the truth is, and you know this, both of you, you know, success is stressful. Mm. And success puts weight on a situation that failure doesn't. Failure is actually very clarifying. Mm. You know right where you are, you know who your friends are, and you know what you don't have. Jeez. And so, you know, but when you suddenly have any kind of success, if it's... Uh, if the person in my mind, I'll talk about myself, if I and I was not sorted out, I didn't have my own identity sorted, right. I didn't have my right. own uh, issues sorted out, then suddenly you're putting a lot of weight on something that can't handle it. And I think in retrospect, that's what went down. Wow. So anyway, I had Thanksgiving lunch and then decided, you know what, I'm I'm going to go, I'm going to leave. And, and where'd you go? I went back home to Kansas and... Uh, Went to college for and, you know there. I didn't graduate because I got a job opportunity about a year later. But where'd you but go? Where'd you work? What was the job? 
Uh, the job was in Colorado, Western Slope, uh, Delta Schools. Um, there was a man from Pittsburgh, Kansas, named Mike Needham, and he was he was kind of like a second dad to me as well. And and he he went out there, and he'd come back to re- find teachers for the school district. And he was a real leader in this what is the STEM world now, where your hands on, minds on, that kind of a thing. And um, he uh, he ran into me when he was back in Pittsburgh, and I think he could see I was lost. Mm. You know, uh, um, my d- I just my dad said, "What do you want to major in?" And I said, "I don't care. You pick." Wow. And so he picked printing management. And now I think he and I both would go, "Hey, what's up with this kid?" <laughs> but back then, so it so wasn't way. did you go back? Not just going back home, but did you go to college because you were like, "Well, this is something that." It you're just supposed to do right now? Or yeah. was it like, I don't know what to do, so I I'll gave go to up music. I gave up everything music and thought, I'm just going to go to college and get a job and, you know, be normal. And it didn't matter what that was going to be. I didn't think, I didn't have a plan. I didn't really yeah. have any plan. And um, so I sold everything except I kept a four track, a drum machine, and a, uh, my DX, and um, mm-hmm. one, of, one of them. And, um, and then I put them in storage, and I went to school, and then I got this job working with a school district where they were innovating new ways of doing, again, for ease of descri- description, STEM. They were, yeah. they were going, how do we, and they were, and it was, and so he was like, I know you don't have your degree, but you need to come out here, and we're going to put you in this role, and you're going to help us help wow. kids. And I had never, and again, that's very adjacent to what my parents were doing. You see that. But at the time, it was I, I saw it differently because I again I didn't think I would go back and and uh, went to Colorado, loved it. It was beautiful, loved him and his family, and still do. And um, so I was out there, and then he went to hire this guy. My dad went to hire this guy, Mike Neen, and Mike said no, he wasn't going to leave at that time, Colorado. And but he said you ought to hire your son, and uh, and so dad. Uh, Asked me if I might consider it, and I said no. And then he came out, and we went to breakfast, and I said, okay, I'll come back for a year. And that was in 90, and the next time I moved was when we moved to Nashville in 2004. Holy cow. Wow. Yeah, so it, it was, it was you know, again, that started a journey, I think, where, you know, kind of creating bridges between my dad and I and and, wow. uh, and understand, and beginning to understand what he, w- he and mom were doing. And he, he really saw it, I mean, if he were here, he would say, "Oh, I did these m- these many things wrong." Um, it's just like I would say that about my own parenting. Yeah. But the reality was, he was they were a living and still are example of people who believed God had called them to do something, not in a haughty way or a "this gives me permission to" way, but in a "it is my work to do." Yeah, yeah. That I am here to help teachers and serve in this way, and he did that. And mom did faithfully that whole time. I mean, they, wow. that's what they spent their life on. And so sometimes that meant um, if we took a vacation, it was related to a convention. If we, yeah, right. anything we did was related, you know, the whole family was involved, you know. And so, um, and I think they, if they were talking, they would go, oh, we shouldn't have done it like that. But, mm. but in a way, it was. I never had a question of what motivated my parents. It was uh-huh. wow, that's an interesting thing you to know, say. So, so it's uh, so I know there are things they would probably do different. Just like I know there's a bunch of things I would do different. Right. But but there was always a clarity that uh, you know that they were trying to help. So to like way oversimplify it, would he? Do you think that he would just say like I should have spent more time at home? like left work at work a little bit more, like had a, a little bit more of a balance there? That's a great question. Um, I think there is an element of the way you were raised impacting your parenting. And I think, you know, in that era, to say I want to go be a musician or a singer or a songwriter or something like that, it was not the American Idol era. It was yeah, not. Yeah. That was a weird thing to say. Well, you know what's interesting, though, it, and I think it happened – early enough that you were too young to maybe like experience it consciously but your parents kind of did something that was unconventional yes right i mean they Mm -hmm. they broke away from what is sort of like the track and they did something risky and entrepreneurial and all that kind of stuff so i wonder how that affected you know they had to have 
some kind of a effect even osmotically in the house that like Absolutely. this is an option on the table you could do your own sort of thing you know? yeah when i was i remember being in high school my sophomore year we had to do reports and i so i wanted to interview producers and engineers so i literally you could call information and get a number i called uh <laughs> Uh, whatever it was called, Blanton and Harrell. M- m- oh, wow. And asked to speak with Brown Bannister. Uh-huh. And, um, and he called me back, and we talked for almost an hour. No way. And then I called L.A., Lion's Share Recording, and asked to speak with Michael Lamardian. And he couldn't, but his engineer, John Guess, a brilliant engineer, called me back and talked Holy to me for cow. a long time. And then there was another producer I called. Again, That's amazing. that comes from, I think, my mom and dad. Yeah, the yeah, idea yeah. that, well, we, we've got to do something here, and we can't wait around for someone to do yeah. it for us. Isn't so that fascinating? That's so yeah, great. There's, a very, there's still very much that way. You know, like a can-do. You just got to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, uh, you can't. Uh, and I think probably the other thing, I think, uh, you know, he was very encouraging. And I was, a, you know, I was a firstborn. I was stubborn. I'm uh, a Taurus or whatever you want to use. Um, I was a difficult kid. Uh-huh. And, um, and so I think, um, well, I'll say this in my thirties, I read five love languages for the first time, or maybe it was late twenties. I guess it was 30 maybe. And it changed in my life yeah. because I suddenly realized he was trying through acts of service to communicate something that he didn't really have the words for. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, and it really broke my heart because mm-hmm. I realized that I had been waiting all this time yeah. for this other thing. Right. Wow. And it really changed how I I saw him, yeah. you know, and uh and so that that really helped. Did you me. have that revelation while you were still living there? I did. Yeah. Oh, so that I'm sure that helped, right? Yeah. And yeah, I think so and and again, you know, he's he's we're both a lot older now. We talk all the time mm. and uh and I'm really grateful to have his his advice you know? so yeah. so so this is such an amazing story so the way that you got i, I, I want to hear you tell the story because i think it's so great but just how your wife encouraged you to do so you, you were living in kansas working with your parents yeah at your job yeah and obviously music's still in there it's percolating it's sort of yeah I it's interesting that you didn't sell all the gear you kept well, a that's little interesting. Bit. I hadn't thought you about know. that. You're right. This is the piece that I'll keep. Just I hadn't thought of that, but that's exactly right. And and I became what is the Cameron calls it uh, a shadow artist. So when I came back in '90, it was still pretty uh, industrial artsy, right? But I had been out in Colorado around this new thing, and my dad was interested in this new thing that was happening. The rest of the little company was probably you know 16. Well, no, there were 32 employees. About Jeez. half of them were managers. And and so I came back as kind of a disciple of this guy, Mike Needham, and um, and was really hell bent for trying to do it right. So you know, I'd read the books, the business books, and and I I just do it. And so uh, and he gave me a lot of uh, latitude. I say sons of owners are either Tommy Boy mm. or they are the devil yeah. because if yeah. they're not Tommy Boy, they're there for a reason. And and I was I wanted. Um, respect and love mm. and mm-hmm. and uh, I wanted to and that's what I was looking for so we grew the company really fast and changed the nature of the company and and I had a real a, you, a big part to play in that with hiring a team of we had animators and video Jeez. editing and a full studio the same as HBO's built exactly like HBO's but built in this nowhere a little town in Kansas you know that, I, that my is home. so cool and um, so we built the company up and um but then there was this question always you know in the back so i would buy gear when i would fly to la or something i'd buy different things that i couldn't afford when i'd been there the first uh-huh. time you know and and slowly by slowly i'm putting stuff together and then there was a young christian artist uh in our town and uh she needed a place to record so i let him use that and i helped with that record and and she got signed to goatee and did some what stuff. was her name jennifer knapp Jeez. And so, um, so yeah, so that was kind of this strange thing that I, I don't talk about it, but I was. Did you write on that record? from there? Or I wasn't a writer then. I didn't write on it, but she's from Chanute there nearby. Okay. And so there was a guy, Byron Funk. He's still a guy. And um, he was, he was her manager and Never her producer know. and her, I mean, everything. Yeah. And um, so, but I had built a studio. Yeah. And it was used mainly for voiceovers. 
uh-huh. but it had you know had 24 gear. tracks and tons Jeez. of gear and neumanns and i mean it was wow built like a guy who's a shadow artist right yeah. you know so if well, i a bit built like a guy who wants to call and talk to an engineer yeah <laughs> and right. So that's right that's right so i i did say to him you know if you needed a studio i know that there's a studio and you could use the studio so um so anyway that's uh they they started recording there and then we mixed that i helped mix that record and um but it was one of those things that I was around a little bit. Which has to be an interesting juxtaposition when you have one gig during the day. Right. You know, that's so what that is. I mean, yeah. those near the twain shall meet of those two. You well, know? like at five o'clock, I would leave my office where I was running things and I'd be wearing whatever khakis and a polo or a blue button down. And then I would go back and be, and be the assistant engineer to to this now guy. did you change the outfit i didn't that's change the outfit that's what's funny and and or and when we were mixing you know it, it was it was hard i think for my team to to or surprising for them to have this guy barking at move that move this you know when i had been the guy who was helping lead it but then i helped mix the thing and then they they went on and did what they did you but know? you had to be sitting in that studio it's kind of like electric because you're like oh my god yeah i'm wondering I'm like it. when that happens you know when when the jennifer knapp first day of working on that thing happens and then the next day you're at work yeah how are you feeling as you're sitting through is it hard to like sit through no. presentations or whatever no at that time you know i was i was fortunate to be able to to sort of be directing things enough that you know we were doing really creative things you know we yeah. were working okay with, so there's a know. creative element yeah we job. were working our editors were trained at the american film institute our artists were working with top software people all over Jeez. the country so we were out of this little town in kansas this little company we were growing this thing and and I think when I stopped really being involved, it was at 190 employees, and it had Good really grown. Gracious! But wow. I, but I that also didn't know where I fit in it anymore. There yeah. was a certain point where, you know, that kind of growth again, success can kind of be deceptive. Mm-hmm. Is really hard on people, and um, and I wasn't sure where I fit. And I, and somewhere in there, towards the end of that, fortunately, I meet Jennifer and uh, my wife, and um, then we got married, and. Um, and so then we're discussing what's the next thing to do, right? And um, Is that out of a place because you're kind of like, I feel like I'm sort of, I don't know what's going on occupationally. Yeah, I, I didn't know where to go. And I didn't know, I didn't know if they really, I didn't know if I was really w- fully wanted there. You know, it's still his company. Yeah. And I wasn't So there sure. wasn't the typical kind of like, I'm grooming you. There's a track yeah. here. You're gonna take over, son. I know that exists, but that wa- at that time that wasn't really how we, how yeah. our, my experience and 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 probably, you know, there's a there's probably a long talk about what all that is. But the end result was somewhere in there. I make a comment about things and another job or another thing that could be done, and Jen said, "Well, if it's your passion," and I laughed, and she was like, "What is this?" What is this laughing? And I was like, I'm in my 30s. That's not how we make decisions. I have a great job in a small town. We need to figure out what we're going to do. Yeah. And, um, well, what did you want to do? Well, I don't know. And she keeps on it, keeps on it. Finally, you're like, well, you know, it's the music thing. I wish I would have done that. I'm getting performing songwriter at the house. I'm the one guy that wants to go see, you know, buddy monlock play in kansas city or uh-huh. or you know or there's uh, tells yeah, everywhere yeah that's yeah. right tells every, I, lyle love it posters and you know i mean i'm way inside the she the walks summer. in and you put the magazine where it was. <laughs> what are you reading <laughs> <laughs> nothing just some really smutty magazine it was around Iris honey let me see it <laughs> performing songwriter ted gum it barry pierce pettis <laughs> and uh you know pierce pettis yes <laughs> God believes in you. Is there any greater song in the world than God <laughs> believes in you? I heard that song and I was like, we need to stop everybody. Wait, what? He did and, it. Uh, he did it. How did he not get the award? Shouldn't you get all the awards for that? And um, so, yeah, so I started. So she found a cruise and said, she came and said, will you take me on a cruise? I said, yes, that's my job. And yeah. she, um, <laughs> she said, it's this one. And Nashville Songwriters Association, I think they only did it twice. This was the second one. They did a cruise, and the faculty was like Prestwood, Craig Wiseman. Good gracious. Um, it was pre-live like you were dying, Wiseman. Um, it was like Bubba Hyde. Yeah, he you know. but, get, but uh, getting cut. But he was still, yeah. oh, and him hits. I mean, he was still, yeah, he, he was had green grass grows. And yeah, 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 yeah. And um, uh, Seskin and um, Angela Cassett and uh, I can't remember, James Dean Hicks. 
Ralph Murphy. So it was that crew. And I'm like, I don't know. And so I, I took a CD with a couple songs, and I sat in the back and took notes. And then the last day, uh, uh, two of them came over and asked me to play a song, and so I did. And they said, don't quit your day job, but you should come to Nashville. We're doing a thing in a month, and you should come. And so we started making trips back and forth. And um, and again, the only people we really knew is uh, Jen Schott was mm -hmm. working as a receptionist at Tom Collins Music. And there's a writer named George Terran we had met. And um, he wrote uh, When I Get to Where I'm Going mm -hmm. with Rivers mm -hmm. and Real Good Man. And, and But he had lots of other songs, uh, Running Out of Reasons or Trevino. And, and so... I started making trips and going to song camps, and I think at the second song camp, the helper didn't show, so I became the helper, and I did that for several times, you know, and uh, my goal there was to make it something everybody would want to be, so they would never be without volunteers, and I think mm. we were able to do that, and then after we'd done it, I think I helped three or four times, um, the pros came to me and said, no more helping. If you're in Nashville, you should be writing and meeting with people and here's wow. people. So the writers are really who let me in, you know, mm -hmm. to that uh, world. So what what finally got you to move here? Let's well, say so I signed with BMG, and then we moved uh, a year and a half later or so. Uh, it was God's will. Oh yeah, yeah. The, when that the cut. And the truth is, and you may know this, this is maybe why you're asking, but that was one of the bigger arguments Jen and I had because. My argument was, like, when I first said I was going to, well, I didn't tell anybody. Isn't else. it, can I just pause to say how fascinating it is that the answer to your question is a song called God's Will, but it's also just God's Will. I see it, I see it now. <laughs> I right. see it now. But uh, at yeah. the time, well, and, you know, I had issues with that, mm -hmm. you know, and th that was a place of. Uh, oh, yeah, literally, like, theologically. Yeah, yeah it was a pain point, and um, I see that now. Yeah. But at the time, you know, I was still trying, you know, I'm trying to write clever songs that's what i thought i was supposed to do was to write something really clever and then they'll they'll sign me right because i wrote something really clever and um, i see that you know where people will think oh my the goal is the flip or the goal is the wink mm -hmm. and um and so anyway what what happened really was um you know once we started once people found out i was trying to become a songwriter um a lot of people that had been friends I had some that stayed right with us the whole way. In fact, that's what we focus on. But there were other folks like that I'm coaching Little League with or flag football with, and they're like, oh, hi, hey, what's what's with the, uh, how's the little songwriting thing? Yes, and they yes. give you the look, you know, and their wives are coming to People Jen. People still do that. Too. And they're going like, hey, you should, uh, you should get Barry a new vehicle, maybe a truck or something. Oh or maybe the guys could go and play golf. Right, this is like a midlife crisis. Or something. Right, he's being Where's crazy. Where's something skimpy yeah. behind? And they're kind of <laughs> saying it to her like, don't let him go crazy because our husbands might act weird too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there was this an This whole thing, house so, of cards could fall. That's right. Yeah. We're all, it's a small town, you know. We're, we're all trying to be amused in some way, right? That's, I feel like a lot of drama in small <laughs> towns is just, everybody's just that a little bit. That is a wildly... Entertaining. That is a wildly <laughs> deep comment. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's the new Vengeance movie that B.J. Novak has. He, oh, yes. There's a saying in there where somebody says, uh, the local guy says, the people here, they're, people act like these people are dumb. They're not. They're really smart. They're just bored, and that can create a lot of trouble. Wow. Uh, and I, I thought, that sounds like, you know, I, I hear stories sometimes from my hometown, and they'll be like, he did what? Oh, yeah. And, uh, totally. <laughs> you know, and you're like, just one day. Just got bored and just yeah. couldn't take it anymore. And so uh, so anyway, uh, when those Can songs... Can I just make a comment really quick? Yeah. How much... I think about this so much, and it's some of my personality type, but how much of life is just being bored? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like as a human, yeah, that's a very real thing. It's just it's like... A very real thing. Oh, yeah. Boredom is a... Like, it's a it, like, I get older. I think about that much more than I used to. Like, yeah. You just kind of find yourself sitting there going like, well, and some people listen to this are like, bro, I'm like <laughs> hoeing my field. What, what is boredom like? Dude, but, I mean, <laughs> we, we could go down a rabbit trail here because I feel like boredom is a real element of life that I hadn't thought about. You know, like when you're a kid, you're like, ah, I'm bored. What do I do? But like, it's, it's like this thing that I'm like, no, the boredom is like some, is like, has an energy. It has like a power to it. Yeah. And as a parent, there's the there's the whole thing where I'm like, my kids are never bored, and I'm worried about that. Like they need to be bored. 
Yeah. But also, like for me, it, it bleeds into like meditation and prayer life and all that kind of stuff. And like me realizing over the last couple of years, maybe probably COVID sped this whole thing up. <laughs> with yeah. Like I am so terrified of just being alone with my thoughts. And I got to like confront that and like, I got to get comfortable with it. I got to l- lean into it. But that's a whole, we could go down that whole road. Those are know. great points because there is this element of time that is unstructured. Yeah. can be boredom or it can be play. Mm. Or for some people, that structure, what, what we might version as boredom, is actually safety. Because mm-hmm. for some people that, the fact that it doesn't change and that we always do this thing on this thing and that's all we do. And, you know, I don't want, and I'm not that guy, but but I have fr- friends that are that way. And you realize, oh, we're looking at the same thing through completely different lenses. Right. And it really is, it, there's an interesting study there, I think you're right, of, of like, when is boredom turned into uh, f- f- space for children for uh, you know unstructured play and for having to create your own toy out of a thing right. you're gonna make your there's own there's a world. muscle that I, as a parent I'm like I'm letting it atrophy I to d- my <laughs> kids detriment I you know I doubt seriously either one of you are harming your children in any way or in any way that is we all make mistakes I right. think yeah but I don't think there's anything going on that's I don't think they'll be lesser for anything. Oh, I think. Barry, you're sweet. No, <laughs> I, d- I, d- I, d- I think it's a huge fear. You know, I mean. Uh, oh, yeah. At least for me, it's. A there's a, there's just, to, to your point, John, and, and we can move on after this. It, it's sort of, it, you said it better than I can. It, it, there's something, there's just an inordinate amount of uh, downtime slash boredom as a human the existence part of human existence is really interesting the older mm. I get. Like and I and, and and all that to say, I have a lot of empathy for people who make bad decisions because they get bored. Like I find the older I get I'm yeah. like Yeah. I sort of get how somebody could go crazy if they've sat around long enough or feel like they don't have a purpose or mm. their job is not giving them some sense of direction or or, or meaning. Yeah. Like Well and I think it's that a it's lot like, of life to sit and feel that way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's just a lot of hours in the day to sort of at some point, yeah. finally go, yeah, I don't love this feeling. And I, I need <laughs> right. to do something to but disrupt But it's like the escape feeling. of it yeah. that that leads to some of that yes. stuff. That's so right. So for me, um, which I, I feel like I I do this a lot, where I'm like looking at, I'm, I'm terrified of like empty nest time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, we have to start. We're like constantly coming to crossroads. And I'm like, I want to take the healthy side, you know, so that in... 12 years or whatever, when we're empty nesters, like, we're good here, or whatever. Here, you know, it's interesting, and I wonder if you feel this way. I mean, I know you've been so, which I want to get to this in a second, with your daughter and all the, the cool stuff y'all are doing around the wheelchair, mm. um, the yard development, which is incredible. But, because so I know you've been busy doing that. But, I mean, I do think what we do for a living, be it the artistic part of our lives, the songwriter part, which we all do, I, I have my hope. I've, I've thought about this a lot, John. My hope with my life is that I'm so well acquainted to the rhythm of that life at, cause there's, there's weeks mm-hmm. like if you don't book and you know, you aren't working on the project and you don't book like stuff and your kids are not super busy. I mean, I know we've talked about this. You can kind of look up and go like, I have like three days where there's nothing on my calendar. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and, and so you kind of have to hit a RPM in your heart and your soul where you're kind of right. like, I need to adjust for these three days. Cause if I'm not careful, I'm going to look up that second day and, and be crazy, which I yeah. know is not a common thing. Probably a lot of guys and girls listen to this because of life's But, I mean, with what we do, and so to your point, right. John, I am like, please, God, let me, by the time I retire, whatever that is, be at least like, no, I kind of know how to do this. Because you yeah. see guys <laughs> and girls come out of the stratosphere just steaming into retirement, yeah. and they sort of hit the brakes. Some people, like, I, I feel like my parents have done this really well. They were just so busy and so tired of being busy that they've loved retirement. They loved it. They yeah. are like, man, second yeah. gear is the best gear in the world. Right. You know, right. they kind of get to the finish line, fall down, barely get their hand across <laughs> the line, and they're like, I'm done. Now I can retire. I can enjoy yeah. that. But I think, you know, there's a lot of people who come in screaming and hit zero so quick that they kind of go crazy in a year yeah, or two, you know, right. or they get For another sure. job. Oh, where yeah. They, you know, they're working. That, that transition oh. is, is tricky. I think. And so I think there is yeah. something that I hope, I hope 
that we that because of what we do and we're intermittently retired for a couple of days at a time yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. every month yeah. that you sort of go no i kind of think i know even if i don't even if i don't know what it's like to retire i have glimpses of glimpses of it enough to have a little bit of a thought around how what right. to do with it where right. i think there are other occupations you can come in so hot that yeah. you're like six months in totally. you're like i've never had more fun six months in a day in you're like you know, just wake up <laughs> well, and there's, and there's like, like a <laughs> subtle hum. There's, there's the, ma- the micro thing. Thing. There's mm-hmm. the macro, then there's the little micro things. And I kind of feel like I'm in a, in a phase where the micro things are, are the, what trip me up. They're going like, to get I'm you. Like, <laughs> yes. And I'm talking micro like, like I'm going to go to bed tonight. I'm not going to, no phone, yeah. no book. I'm just going to lay down and close my yeah. eyes. And I and I I'm saying that right now. I'm I'm not gonna do that tonight. Probably it's yeah. too like I don't want to do that. And I and I don't like that. I so don't want to do that. Yeah. Part of me is like, why can't you just lay down and just go, just go pee without your phone? Yeah. It's terrible. That's <laughs> yeah. just so me true. and my thoughts. Yeah. yeah. For you know. Anyway. Hey Dave. Yeah. I would like to. Oh give shoot! I'm sorry, John. Okay, keep going. Oh, there we go. That's I didn't even bad. catch that. Yeah. I'm so comfortable now. Can I can I say something from our, our sponsor, BetterHelp, right now? Free your mind, and the rest will follow. Go, 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 go. Listen, speaking of mind, yeah. my mind gets hazy sometimes with all that. the pressures of daily life. Yeah. I don't know about you. Oh, and mine too. How well would you take care of your car if you had to keep the same one for your entire life, right? You'd probably take care of it. That's how really our brains work, John. So why don't we treat them like that? I totally agree. Yeah. There are plenty of ways to support a healthy brain like learning a new language or taking power naps, oh, there there's also BetterHelp Online Therapy. I'm all about them naps. Plus, since it's online, it fits within your schedule. You That's can right. do video, phone, or even live chat sessions. No need to comb that hair, Johnny. No, no need. But I'm glad and you it's do. it's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you'll be matched with a therapist within 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash DadVille. That's BetterHelp.com slash DadVille. I don't think I had a, a, a day, a moment that I was awake or even asleep without music blaring. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. No, this you're explaining my life. like... I was definitely late into my 20s. I had a counselor, the same creativity as a cur- his Active Courage guy. Um, he was in Springfield, which was like, you know, let's say an hour and a half away, a little less than that, actually. But he would say, I want you to drive over, no phone, no music, nobody coming with you. I Jeez. want you to drive over to the thing and drive home. And I remember, the f- I, would, I can still, when you were talking about that, I can still remember that first drive seemed like it took forever if i'd have been yeah. a wagon it wouldn't have been slower <laughs> and uh, i just felt a wagon like going backwards you know i felt like i was just like but over time i got i got where i could could do it and and now i'm more of a friend with there's an old uh, there's a singer from the way way back named randy stonehill and uh, i don't even know this song but i just remember this line all the time uh and it it, it bothered me when i was young and the line was it's like i we know in our soul if we told uh, turn off the music the wind will be crying his name. Wow. Mm-hmm. And um, and I was always like, I don't want to turn off. I, I always wanted it yeah. on. You know, I always wanted something to comfort. Yeah. And But I also would say this I just, uh, about that. There is, when empty nest occurs, which was probably for me never, but when that happens, mm-hmm. there will be a new thing that is as mm-hmm. good or better. Yeah. And that's just as hard to prepare and trust for. Right. As knowing it is you yeah. know i mean it's the true. unknowing is very hard and and i know that's going to be the case and and but it's it it's a hard thing to do and i also think there are seasons we go through and i don't know you know uh this would have been a better topic with al andrews i think for sure and uh but i do i remember reading a book about seasons in a in a man's life and and i remember thinking oh i see now like i i used to feel so much guilt that i worked a lot Mm-hmm. And I do wish I worked less. And I do feel bad about um, lots of choices I made, you know, especially with my oldest and working so hard and being gone so much. And uh, at the same time, that was the season I was in. And that is something that, right or wrong, he took from me. Mm, and yeah. I took it from my dad. Yeah. And so mm. there is a certain point where um, it does become what you know. And... Um, and whatever you do, they'll probably 
uh, some one of them will react to it and do the opposite, yeah. which is it will be interesting. They'll be like quietly meditating all the time. You'll be like, how in the world are they doing that? And yeah. uh, they're just doing it to make you crazy. That's yeah. all. <laughs> <laughs> tell me this. What what? Tell us about what you've been working on lately. I think this is oh. just. Such yeah. a fascinating thing. Yeah, so uh, several years ago, four or five years ago, um, my daughter, Catherine, um, also Jen's daughter, uh, is uh, in <laughs> a wheelchair. It happens to be. It happens to be. So convenient. She's in a wheelchair, and she has cerebral palsy. She was born very, very early, and... Um, and I don't advise it. I say you wait the whole time. I think you know. Just <laughs> it just makes yeah. everything. It's a forty easier. weeks. Just just yeah. wait the forty. I just, <laughs> just settle in. Stop being impatient. <laughs> and uh, but she was born sixteen weeks early, and so um, that was a whole journey, you know, that we went on. Because she's how old now? She's twenty one. Okay. And um, and you know that and that that you know this I think, but that fundamentally changed how I wrote songs. I wrote that day mm. with Tom Douglas my first time, and I threw every clever idea I had. And he took me to lunch, which tells you how bad I was doing. <laughs> and uh, the old Houston's were picked up. Yes, uh -huh. yes. And uh, and then we came back to Fire Hall, Sony. And um, I don't know why, but he said, "Let's go back in," which I can't, still can't believe he did. Uh, um, changed your life. Yeah. And we go back in. He says, "Is there anything else?" And and I'd kind of run out of clever things to say. Mm. And um, but when Catherine was in the NICU in the middle of the night, somebody had said, "Well intentioned." As we were walking back in that NICU uh, in St. Louis, um, somebody said, well, we don't know why it is, but this is God's will. And on the walk in, I said to Jen, oh, look, there's God's Isaac and there's God's. Mm. And she said, careful, you know, like, where are you going with this? And so that night I wrote, um, why does this bother me? What am I wrestling with? And I had grown up, you know, I'm very fortunate. You know, I grew up in a, in a, a home where, you know, Faith was a really big deal, um, maybe even too big of a deal if that's possible. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody, uh, Natalie and I joke, him be, you know, the, I'll say it started Pentecostal, but it was more charismatic because <laughs> Pentecostals kind of cry when they pray and, and charismatics kind of claim things. And so it was a little more of that. And, uh, but, but I grew up in that environment. And so sometimes it was used a little flippantly, mm. maybe, yeah. the will of God. And uh, who am I? But uh, but it felt that way. And right. I had some issues with it and had lost some friends mm. and it had some things that were I had not sorted. Yeah. And um, so I wrote that night. Because all you could do, you sit there all night in this NICU in St. Louis and just write and write and write and write. So that day I said to Tom, you know, uh, I really don't have any other titles or anything, but I did have this one weird thing about God's will, but it's like a boy. And he was like, what? And I was like, because like, you're always told like, this is the will, but you don't know, and you wrestle with it. And then Tom knew, you know, being a Presbyterian, he spent a lot of time over there. And that's the reason I thought of Tom, you know, Calvinist. And uh, so, uh, glad that's over with. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> One of my favorite jokes <laughs> of all time. What does a Calvinist say after he fall down the stairs? I'm so glad that's over with. Yeah, I mean, predestination. And uh, so uh, <sighs> so he he took off and and uh, sort of played something, and then I played something, and then we started working on something. And he said, what else do you have? And I opened my journal and tore the pages out and spread them there. And I like to say, then Tom Douglas taught me how to write a song because yeah. uh -huh. he basically was like, this is what you're wrestling with, and this is what you're trying to say. And, mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then we wrote that song. So Catherine has always been a very interesting person, you know, in, you know, and I think that's why I was so freaked out with Olita and God's Will when it got cut, because I thought if, if it has to hurt this bad to write a song, yeah, you know. But yeah. at the same time, it also made me. Um, neither of them followed the structure of the time, and mm -hmm. neither of them made sense as commercial. I just thought, well, I'm going to try to follow this path that, that you know Tom is showing, and Mike Reed was such mm -hmm. a big deal to me, and still is. So anyway, flash forward. Um, Catherine's getting older. And Troy Virgis, I think you wrote uh -huh. Troy quite a bit, and um, or did. And uh, Troy is amazing, and his mother is amazing. And she had, uh, I think it's Guillaume Barre is how you say it. And so she w was in a wheelchair. She'd never been in a wheelchair, but suddenly she was in a wheelchair. And she took a ramp, turned just a little too soon, and threw her in the street and it hurt her. And, and so it really was horrible. But she had the same kind of chair my daughter had. And so I thought, oh, man, we need to get a, a chair that's uh, safer. And you know how the world is. I mean, Peloton, you know, my bathroom scale can tell me my favorite 
color. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, everything's so connected, right? And uh, so I thought, we'll just find it. I couldn't find it. And uh, then uh, I called my brother. I said, I'm doing research. I can't find this. There has to be, maybe it's in Europe, a smarter chair that has some basic collision avoidance like a car would have or drop-off protection or just actually something we could hack, just a brain on it that yeah. we could hack. And no, turns out they hadn't really changed very much in the last 20 some years. You know, this would be a very short story if I didn't have a brother 14 years younger than me who's a genius engineer mm -hmm. in systems and product design. And um, so he and I talked and then he built a prototype and, and it worked. And so then I was like, my gosh, this could help a lot of people, you know, other friends of Catherine's in our family. And Can I tell you what I think is unbelievably crazy about this story already? is thinking how much your parents and you share the same ideology. Yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't see it then, but I do see yeah. it now. Yeah. Isn't so that crazy? It is crazy. And, and well, yeah, it's crazy. Or, you know, my dad would say, it's not crazy. It's a God thing. You know, <laughs> yeah. he, would, yeah. he would not see it as crazy. It is not serendipitous. It yeah, is not right, an accident. right, right, right. But, but for people who struggle with that kind of talk, you know, I mean, it is, it has been an interesting fact that, a lot of the things that my parents might have even called uh, regrets or mistakes mm. or I wish we hadn't have been, those things saw, look, this is a way to help a lot of people and let's see if we can find it anywhere else. We went to the International Seating Symposium, which is the big uh, seat of mobility oh, yeah, yeah, conference. Yeah. No one was working on it because it's really hard. And also because, um, frankly, uh, you know, it's a it's an industry that exists in kind of a a back lot. Uh, medical doesn't really worry because it's durable medical goods, and tech doesn't really worry about it. And uh, you know, so it's kind of over here. Even if you're getting your degree in physical therapy, you might spend five years on your degree and only spend five hours on wheelchairs. Yeah. And if you think about it, there are lots of people who you know work with a physical therapist. Oh, we'll get you back playing golf. We'll get you back to normal. We'll get, you know, physical rehabilitation back to normal. Right, right. Yeah. What happens when you're Catherine Dean and you had these massive bleeds in your brain when you were 16 weeks early? And you will improve, but you will never be, quote, back to some mm. stereotypical normal. Um, that's a different approach. Yeah. And very important. Mm. Um, and so... Jared just, you know, we were able to see a prototype that worked. And, and so then I was like, oh, my gosh, this, this could help a lot of people. And we really thought we'll just do the legwork on f sorting it all out, get a little, uh, you know, c file a few patents, and then we'll, um, we'll go to them. They'll be thrilled, right? They'll be thrilled. The industry will be thrilled. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so what you learn about that is that the industry – and I'm not talking about people who are working at everyone in the company, but I'm saying at the top level, at the C-suite and the core of why an industry exists. Um, th they weren't looking for innovation, and they, w and they don't consider the person in the chair the customer. They have mm. a payer code with insurance <sighs> and Medicare and Medicaid. Right. And They've got a sweet little... Yeah, it's a sweet Train ride. That's running. They're making, you know, depending upon what level they are, they're, there's, they're making about 160% margin on things. Jeez. Wow. So it's a cash cow, right? They yeah. I make it for $100. I sell it for $1,000 or more. And, you know, let's roll. You know, I mean, so there's always a dad like me with a daughter like mine yeah. or a person who just found out, God forbid, that they have ALS and they are going to be fighting that fight. There's always somebody who needs their product and they can sort of control it. There's five manufacturers. There's three national distributors. There wow. it is. The That's the whole market. So, so, so what are the the like? How would you sum up what your chair, her chair, does? How is it different? So, so it's a it's a frame that goes on existing power chairs. We didn't make a new chair because, you know, they're just wheels and a boat battery and a seat. You know. Yeah. But we you put the frame on and it's got radars that we invented with TI and uh, Intel RealSense cameras that we hot rodded with them and, and then uh, ultrasonics that are special custom and there's an ARM processor just like your phone and it's connected to the rest of the world you know through secure networking military grade stuff and so what it means is uh, you won't drive into a wall 
Yeah. Um, which those crashes can break your knees and yeah. your toes. Right. And yeah. So you won't drive into things or other people or your service animal. And you won't drive off a curb, which happens a lot. And, I mean, there's there's two or three times more people going to the ER every year in the U.S. for wheelchair in their injuries than motorcycle accidents. Holy no cow, way. Barry. Yeah, shocking. And, again, I got to tell you, I have a daughter who's been in – this is her third or fourth chair – and I didn't know this stuff. So I start yeah. researching the market because of where I come from originally. Yeah, market yeah. Background. And you start going, oh, wait, I see what this is. This is uh, this is quite a situation. And we've been really welcomed. We wanted, I can say this because my brother and his team really are to credit for this. If, Like I said, it's a very short story. Songwriter dad wishes something different. That would be the end of the story. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Jared and his team and Pete Knapp, our COO, and what they all do. And, and so... We started this company. Well, first we worked on it for about a year. Then we went to one of the companies in the industry, and uh, and they're here. You know, there's a lot of industry companies here in Nashville, and um, they really wanted to buy it to shelve it so it wouldn't disrupt things. Oh. And um, I couldn't believe it, by the way. But but then we had the meetings, and our advisors were right. You know, and uh, the people who helped develop OnStar. And a lot of precision agriculture, yeah. you know, GPS. They helped us develop this, and so, um, so then we were like, "Oh my gosh, we got to start a company." So four years ago, uh, we started a company, and we were getting ready to come out when the world locked down. Mm. And so then we did announce uh, two years ago about this time, and um, and fortunately we won, you know, Time Magazine and Popular Science Jeez. and Fastco and, and all those yeah. came out and really supported us. We were just at. Uh, Fortune in Aspen, and Fortune has speak in in uh, Silicon Valley uh, in December. We're in F Forbes article dropped today. No so way. I mean, so Barry. so the outside the industry in the tech world, everybody was like, we totally get it. We've got about twenty four patents, and and our patents are being cited by Apple and other people. I mean, so so we did the work, and in the industry, you've got. A group of companies who are working with us and excited, but you've got a couple of companies who are trying to kill us. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, they're spreading lies and they're doing things, and and it's a little tough, you know. I mean, you see some of these folks in town, you know. What I mean, like, you know, you're, wow. you're, you're like, oh my gosh, you 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 know, how, why? Why I get yeah. it, I get it. You don't get to make your crazy margin on this because the margin isn't this high because we're trying right. to make sure everybody can get to it. Yeah. But it does other things too. It, it like your seating uh, pressure injuries are a huge issue. That's uh -huh. what killed Christopher Reeve, oh, the, the wow. Superman guy. And, um, so mitigating pressure injuries. And we know from stats, by the way, that everyone in a wheelchair will deal with it. 97% of people will deal with pressure injuries. And, and that's where you just, you can't adjust, you can't, your right. body is like sitting in the same Yeah, spot and you, your long. skin starts, the tissue dies. It yeah. cuts off blood flow to that area of your, your seated area. And, um, and it's, it can, surgeries, and then you're bedridden for a long period of time. You right. can't go to work, you can't go out in the community. And so, so the result of what we're doing now is to be able to begin to help warn about those things, show mitigation, give readouts of that. Jeez, uh, there's Barry. a new thing we just showed that will allow you to never drive off ramps into your van again using tagging. And th there's a whole bunch of things that are possible because we were uh, able to invent a platform. It's, it, it works. Yeah. If you think of it like a platform, that's probably the best way to think is, uh, or an OS, you know, we're able, it, there, yes, there's this hardware thing that goes in the chair, but already two of the five manufacturers are going to start installing it at the factory in the next month. So we'll move more out of hardware and into software and, and data. So it's been, you know, I'll write a few days and then I'll go do that. And sometimes they'll cross over, you know, and I'll go, like I played the San Jose radio show out there, you know, with Nate and then had meetings while mm -hmm. I was in Silicon Valley. And so it, it, it's been a strange uh, whirlwind, but in a way, I've always, pr pretty much always been doing two jobs anyway. Even when yeah. we moved here to write, I continued to oversee and produce voiceovers. I didn't do the voiceovers, but I produced them for software for the company. So there would be insurance for my family. Yes. You know? So yeah. so I've always had to, you know, I've always been that way. And, and so that's been kind of what we've done. But that, I think the hardest part of the journey, you would, I would think it would be the risk of the money and the time away and all the work. But it actually, the hardest part has been 
that you can have a couple of companies try to try to destroy opportunities mm -hmm. for people. I mean, what's the if there is a, is karma? What is the karmic debt ongoing? Right. Look, all they would all a person would like is for their wheelchair to be as smart as a toaster, right? And you're stopping that. To be oh, a, I can't know. imagine. And it's it's so personal. You couldn't yeah. be more personal. Yeah, and so it's it's been, a, and now we're doing, right now we're working with investment and funding, you know, and getting the next round of funding for the company. And everything to this point has been uh, our family. And, mm -hmm. uh, but but now, so that's exciting. You know, in the next few months, that'll start to close and, and be done. And that'll allow it to, to kind of take off and grow. And, and I believe, you know, we'll come back in a year or so. And, and what you're going to see is a lot. I mean, there's, Right now, there's a million more people that live their whole life in wheelchairs. And they get to buy a new one every four or five years. So uh, one young lady called it her pair of pants she has to wear for five years in a row. Wow. Yeah. And so there's a million more of those people than there are driving electric vehicles in the U.S. Wow. A million and more. It, most people just haven't. And it's I understand. Most people have just not thought about it. Right. And, um, and that's not wrong. But, but it is an interesting opportunity to go... If we can build intelligence and safety so that riders can have more confidence in what they're working with and more health information as well. We work with Amazon Alexa and all those things. And wow. um, and then I want us to start working with, you know, festivals to provide yeah. lanes. And, and it's so that way everybody's safe in their travel and, and we're encouraging people to get out and feel a part of the world. So yes. how, do you, how do you work with, like, insurance companies on getting them to cover because I'm, I'm yeah i'm guessing this is this is a lot more expensive than a regular chair well yeah they buy the regular chair and um and this is interesting too um for instance my daughter's chair is like a camry it's a uh -huh. very nice but it's not yeah but it's it's very nice and the retail on it was eighty two thousand dollars wow now that gets settled out with insurance in the high 30s and normally I write a check for some feature or something. So like yeah. if you want a charger for your phone on a wheelchair, that's a $540 option. Seems a little sti steep, does it not? I mean, Steve. and uh, yeah, yeah, so if you want tilt and recline, that's that's 10 to 12 grand. I mean, so every little thing is a is a money maker, if you will. Right. So the that's a bummer, but w the answer to your question is we assumed Lucy, Lucy costs about eighty five hundred bucks. We thought, oh, that's going to be private pay, but um, but that's not what's happened in the first year plus of our business. Uh, only four percent of our sales have been private pay. The rest have been covered by Medicare and Medicaid. Wow, insurance. that's great. And and over half our sales were VA as well. We've been yeah. done a lot of work, and that's you know it's that's the best part of the the Lucy journey, and and. And it was a scary thing to do. I d I'm not going to lie. When we first started, there were a few friends that were like, oh, don't tell anybody in the music business that you're doing this or they want to write with you because you're not focused. Mm -hmm. And I was worried about that. And um, but, but at a certain point, we just decided to do it. And some folks did go, so how's the little wheelchair thing going? Mm -hmm. You know, just like my friends had done, you know. And, yeah, and right. I get it because it's so right. weird, right? So if I looked at you right now and said, I'm going to be an underwear model, you would go, I don't no and I'm uh, interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is this a special magazine of some kind um but but so i get it that it's it's performing it's, songwriter. It, it's performing songwriter yeah. and there's a new section, <laughs> a new section. <laughs> after the petty interviews then comes the strange deal where the plus pity size, interviews plus size songwriters that. yeah <laughs> there's petty interviews and pity inter pity, yeah, pity the interviews pity. Pity and reviews. reviews. Very yeah. nice. And so that, it just feels like I hear you talk about it. I'm like, I just can't think of more of a love letter to your daughter. Totally. It just feels like this incredible. Obviously, you have a lot of sweat, blood, sweat, and tears in the project itself. So, yeah. I mean, me saying that's a very poetic thing because you're like, you should say how much I've worked on this. <laughs> but, you know, right. it, it just, right. I can't think of something that is more of just a beautiful example of a dad trying to serve a child well and yeah. you all we all want to serve our kids and especially i would have to imagine when you have a child who is dealt the hand that she's dealt yeah you want to help all the more and and so often it's like you can't do anything you can just be there so to have this thing where it's like this is a kinetic thing that i can like 
really dive into has got to be really satisfying. I think so. And I, I, um, I, you know, also I'm her dad. So, Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I'm keep rambling on these crazy stories, but one of the first things Jared and I did was Catherine had an issue at night, you know, where she'd have a lot of saliva Uh and it would pool. It was kind of gross and I felt bad. It was on her skin. So I said to him, could we make a pillowcase that would wick like sham wow it, but feel like a spa. And my brother's like, you're such an idiot. <laughs> you know, he's, he's just putting up with me. And, uh, but, uh, but, but he figured it out. I could say we figured it out. Like when we write yeah. a song. Yeah, yeah, I right. wrote it down for Dave, right? It's same <laughs> no, deal. Jared do that. figured it out. He yeah. created these layers. And, and so it did it. And so it was really cool. And we did them. And several people use it. I think, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think Sean McConnell's daughter used it. Oh, and yeah. Other folks used it. Th- the fact is, uh, that's not as big a problem now, but my daughter doesn't use it because it doesn't match. <laughs> and that, to me, is the most dad moment where you're that's like, so great. I saw this problem and I, right. fixed, Here it I is. fixed it for you, honey. Here you are. It's red and does not no. go with what I am doing here. Oh right. She didn't say gosh. it like that. <laughs> but it, it is funny. Like, so, you know, with, with a lot of the things we're doing now with Lucy, um, I think she's, you know, somebody asked me, how does she feel about it? Mm. I'm not sure she's fully aware that it's catching her when it's catching her. Yeah. What she's aware of is she's allowed to be more independent yeah. mm-hmm. and do things she wants and she has her freedom and we aren't messing with her chair. And yeah. she likes that. Yeah. And I think the seating will be the same thing. She will really enjoy, because pressure injuries are, are a devastating thing. And, and so the idea of mitigating those and, and making those less is, uh, is a worthy thing. So yeah. how, do your, how do your sons think about it? Like I think, uh, I'm not sure that my 13-year-old thinks about it mm-hmm. very much. Um, but my 15-year-old, wants, he wants in the fight. Wow. So, yeah, he's, uh, he has a polo. Uh, with Lucy on it, he's yeah. always wanting to go. I love he's that. He's aware that we're engaged in, you know, marketing strategy. F- you know, you have typical marketing, but then you also have some marketing where you're trying to to deal with an ecosystem that not a whole ecosystem, but a few players that are they're bad actors. They're 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 basically being bad guys in the movie. Yeah. Uh, one of my good friends, Scott Erstesol, but he used to always say, "I want to make sure I'm the hero of the movie." Mm-hmm. Uh, and he would always kind of encourage me when it was a tough time and I would think I'm going to say do whatever you want just make sure you stay the hero of the movie mm. the hero of the movie probably says he's sorry yeah you yeah. know the hero of the movie is going to admit when he's he's wrong or he's going to not say it even though he could right and it's hard for me you know but it's helpful to have that but there's some people who are being bad guys and as he became during lockdown where I'm working in the front room and he's in the other room he, he he took it. He's he's he wants to be a part of it. Mm. So I think if we go back out on the road, um, doing road shows and meetings, we'll, we'll probably let him go and stuff. Oh, that's so he's, cool. Um, but I think he he sees it and and he'll send me notes. You know, have you thought about this? You know, uh, so this cool. YouTuber did this. You could do that. And Johnny, Dave, Johnny, Dave, Johnny, Dave. There it is. Okay. Okay. I, I was looking for the right one. Yeah. Um. I got some bad news, and you've written a song about this, John. Yeah, I think I know where you're going with this. Would say it. Summer is over. Thank you. Yes, I wanted you to say that. We were tangled in the morning sun. I want to do that for years. (laughs) Years, John. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm looking at my calendar, and it agrees with you. Yeah, I think you're right. It makes me sad that grilling season, it's almost done, John. I know. Almost well done. (laughs) Hey, there. I knew you had something in there. (laughs) When it comes to charred meat. Do you like to mix it up, John? Indeed, I Where do, you Dave. That? You know that. Okay. That's why my go-to for grilling is ButcherBox. Okay. Okay, let me tell you why. ButcherBox is a subscription service that delivers high-quality meat and seafood right to your doorstep. Ooh. You now, can they s- could leave it on the corner, and you well, could walk down and get it. Others may. Others may. Not ButcherBox. No. They're right like, to your door. Where do you live? We want to actually bring it to you. Yep. That's why they love you, John, is they do yep. that. This is the extra step, or maybe 20 to your doorstep. You can choose from a carefully curated selection of 100% grass-fed beef, free-range organic chicken, wild-caught seafood, and more. And there's just something about that grass-fed beef, Dave. Yeah, yeah. It almost makes me want to start a cow farm, you know? I, uh, you in on that? I... I have a suspicion that's not legal in Nashville, but I'm not saying no. I'm we'll just check, saying I won't we'll be there when the it. cops show up, okay? Yeah, we'll check into yeah. it. Yeah. So in the meantime, mm-hmm. there are no antibiotics or added hormones. Yeah. 
right? Each order is packed fresh and shipped frozen for convenience. So you can save time on your next grocery store trip. Yeah. Customize your own box or go with one of theirs. Yeah. Either way, you get exactly what you want. That sounds amazing, amazing. Oh. which means phenomenal and amazing. Oh, okay. And all, all that, all that for less than six bucks a meal on average, That's John. Amazing. Get summer sizzling started, mm, even though you. summer's almost over. Yeah. With this special butcher box deal for our listeners, free Don't say bacon. It. I'll say it again, Dave. No, I didn't free say bacon it. for the life of your membership, plus a hundred bucks off. Mm-hmm. Sign up today at butcherbox.com/dadville and use the code bonus one hundred to get one pack of free bacon in every box. For the life of your membership, plus $100 off your first order. That's butcherbox.com slash dadville and use the code BONUS100 to claim this amazing deal. (laughs) Again. It's running parallel. It is so stinking parallel to your parents that your son is picking up, at least your eldest, your youngest is probably like, you know. Yeah. He's, he's, it's like you and your brother. (laughs) Yeah. He's like, I'm going to live this life. But you can at least see with your oldest son that he's going, oh, if there's a problem, you just go solve it. You, you, whatever the thing is needs to get done, yeah. just like your parents. Yeah. There's a hole in this industry we see, and we want to help people with it. Yeah. You, did, you and your brother both face the industry. I mean, Jen, too. And went, yeah, Jen there's a hole in this industry. Let's, she's making the snowballs. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Right. She yeah. But isn't that crazy to yeah. think about? And, he's, and I would say this, too. The 13-year-old, his nature is really... Um, they're both. I I just think they're wonderful, and of course, my older son. You know, he's great, and so it's it's been a real interesting journey. This mm-hmm. whole lockdown, and then launching the company during. Oh yeah, because you have a son older than. Yeah, my oldest was thirty. That's right. Yeah, and That's right. Uh, so when she uh, when I met Jennifer, I was a single dad raising a boy, and. Can we even um, skip that? Come on. No, Barry. that's all right. And uh, so um, I've put uh, you know. 28 years or whatever and 600 miles between that story um and me but uh, <laughs> but no it is one of those deals where you know when we moved here we had alex going into eighth grade yeah and Catherine was four or, or something like that and um maybe just about to turn four and um so we've I can, i'd have to do the math but i think that's right and um so yeah they it's it's a it's a crazy family and uh, well to the thing which we didn't even talk about which parents who or walking through this journey like y'all are. I remember at a right years ago, you were telling me and whoever was in the right with us, maybe Jonathan Singleton, I think, yeah. about the things y'all had to do to retrofit your house mm-hmm. right? so that Catherine could be comfortable. And it was just I'm mind sure it's a boggling. whole other world that your eyes are open to. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we, we did remodel it. And, and Jen built a website out to share how we did it. How you and did it. All the models of that, just to start. Because it was hard to find that information. And um, I think things are better now than that. But mm-hmm. we we pushed pause on that to do Lucy. <laughs> really? <laughs> so we thought, well, I'll take three to six months, and then we'll be back. And and uh, and and like, and I, we really, I was starting to produce a little bit, and so we just pushed pause on everything except Lucy. We thought we'll do that. Yeah. And um, and then and that's been you know four years ago and so, or more. And so, I yeah, here's what I will say too. You know, I don't normally talk a lot about it, but we feel very blessed and specifically what i mean by that is unmerited favor isn't that what they call grace mm. and uh, i mean where you can't believe that in spite of the mistakes and in spite of the failures and the setbacks and the choices that shouldn't have been made or or should have been made um that you get to be here and you get to have this family and you get to have these experiences um, every day I have to do my prayers and my things I read and my object writing. I do, I have a pretty ritualistic about it. And, um, because I want to make sure I'm set as well as I can, uh, in that attitude. Cause it's very easy for me at least to slide into the gray or the dark. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And maybe that's part of the songwritery mm-hmm. thing, yeah. the melancholy thing. Well, but don't want to lose the whole thing. Saddest yeah. songs of country music. Saddest that's songs of country music. <laughs> That's your gasoline, yeah. though, so don't let's yeah. don't get rid and of it. And even that, even the sad song thing, 
there was a moment where one day somebody said, have you heard this song? It's really sad. I can't remember what it was, but it might have been like Three Wooden Crosses or something like that. And I was like, oh, God, I heard it. I just can't. It might have been Letters from Home, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a monster song, uh, David Lee and Tony Lang. And um, I said, I can't do it. I love it so much, but I hate, I hate listening to songs that are that sad. I like uh -huh. happy songs. And everybody at the office was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> They're like, I'm sorry, Barry, you would say, Did sorry. you say, you like, and it turns out, yeah, I do like, you know, I know all of them. Yeah. All the fun songs. Okay, Small Side, you know what song? It made me cry mowing my yard. That's how, wow. and it does it every time. What's that? Uh, One More Day, Diamond Rio. Oh. Yeah. I can't, uh, that's how I feel and about that And you think song. you're ahead of it. And then oh. it gets you. <laughs> I'm like, I got you. Because it's kind of, because you know, it's a big chorus. It's yeah. not like a sad chorus. And I'm telling you, hand the Bible. I'm in the middle of my yard and I have to turn the mower off because sweat and tears are stinging my eyes. And I'm just like, I want more day to be with you. I don't know. Yeah, I think Jen Dean lives, and I know my boys do, even in movies, and things like that, they live for those things. Where they'll, here we go. Oh yeah, 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 it's the breath. You know, you're just yeah, like you're trying to control you it. regular breath, and uh, <laughs> you're just like, oh no, I can't take it. You know, and uh, yeah, that's that fine. well, so so we've kept you here forever, by the way. And there's oh. a million more I questions. Know, I doubt really seriously great. I've given you anything useful, but because I, I heard the other interviews and like they all had like really no good no plan no don't you do book. that. You know, they had a book. Do they were. We have a book. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, yeah. We'll have you back when the book's ready. Oh, okay. So as you know, we always end with a couple of questions. Okay, I'll try. Um, do you want to go first or me? I'll go first. Okay, go. Yeah, we'll switch it. Okay. Um, what is the one thing you want your kids to know? Hmm. I I think it. I you know you want to say that I love them, but I think it is that I love them the way they are, mm -hmm. and that I'm proud of the way they are. I with my oldest boy. Uh, I had. I grew up in a time where this was normal, so I want to protect my dad here a little bit. But there was this deal where it'd be like, 92% of what you do is good, or 98% of what you do is good, it's the 2% that ruins it. And he was just trying to get me to try harder. Yeah. Motivate me. But I kind of heard it, and that kind of spilled into my theology as well. And so with Alex, my oldest, I really wanted him to know, I love you, you're perfect the way you are. Yeah. And that sounds great until you realize it's the same trick. I didn't mean it that way because <laughs> at a certain point he's trying to be perfect because he's been told he's perfect. Yeah. Like I was trying to get to perfect. Right. right? right. Wow. And I had never thought of that. And mm -hmm. so with the younger guys, <laughs> he was the stunt child, with the younger <laughs> guys and gals, I think I'm trying to go out of my way to just, just let them know that way you do that thing. I love you that way. I th mm. I love that about you. T all of the things, mm. and that uh, I'm again. I'm I'm just as demanding or more so than other parents. I think, but mm. but I love you the way you are, who you are. Mm. Um, I'm not doing a good job of saying it, but I think that's mm. mm -hmm. the main thing. I don't need you to be perfect this way, and I don't need you to achieve perfect. B both of them are putting a pressure on. Uh, I'm thinking of that counterfeit God's book. Yeah. Yeah, too much. It's too much for the for their their feet to hold, and yeah. uh, and so so I've I've been trying to do that because they're very different. Each one of them, you know how yeah. it is. I mean, they're, yeah. they're different. They're similar, but they're very different. And uh, so that that is small aside. I mean, I think it, that's a ten part series for Dadville. It's like how children from the same parents <laughs> can be so wildly yeah. different, right? Yeah. And just yeah. the idea that, like, and this is wisdom we always get on this show, but, like, how you just can't do, like, this is the way the Dean's parent, this is the way right. the Barnes parent. Well, mm -hmm. and they have different upbringings. Yeah, Same that's house, exactly right. That's exactly two right. two different experiences. Yeah, I mean, that's why birth order is like it is, all those things. Yeah. But it's, yeah, you're right. There's this. Those are all frames, aren't we? I mean, like, love mm -hmm. languages and birth order. And there, there's so many helpful now frames yeah. that let you kind of read it and look at your world through it and go, Oh, I didn't see. I was not aware of it. Yeah. I live in it, yeah. but I didn't see it. And so I feel like those kinds of things, like the birth order book, and, the, mm -hmm. and the, those things are like these Give frames. You a little. Yeah. It's like really said, love language. I mean, that's a game yeah. changer, man. Yeah. It, for me, it was. I mean, I'd never thought of any of that. But oh, you read it and you went, oh, and it's helped. You know, it, Annie and I had a conversation the other night, and I told her this, and we've been married almost 17 years now. 
it's one of the most um, helpful, eye-opening conversations we've ever had. Because at one point she looked at me and she's like, and I'm 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 uh, not exactly quoting because it was more eloquent than this. Basically, she just said, "You've got to understand that I'm not, and I never will be the way you are." Mm. You know, and you're like 17 years in, that should be. Like if there's a list, that's near one or two. Yeah. Right. There's kind of like things you should know by now. Right. But hearing her say it, I thought about yeah. it for a week. And I was like, I am still under the impression that she should be like me. <laughs> yeah. You know? I totally get that. And so I think I think that with kids too. And yeah. I think that's a whole other, again, topic is like there's usually a kid that you relate to or understand much more than the other ones because they're like you. Yeah. Right. And you're like, oh, I know every little. And that little... can send you in two different that's right. directions. That's yeah. right. Depending on how you react. That's to right. It. Yeah. That's exactly right. But yeah. all that to say. Okay. Second question. Um, what do you want your kids to say at your funeral of light years from now, so far away? Because <laughs> by that point, you've developed heart technology that's Bluetooth that keeps your heart pumping. Yeah. <laughs> past when <laughs> maybe it should be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh... I just I I think of funerals I've been to that were they were sad but they were beautiful and there was a lot of laughing mm. and there was a lot of like uh, I hope it's not unfinished I I hope they feel like um, I I hope they're sad I always joke say you know, I hope they're sad when I'm gone um, but uh, they they probably won't be uh, but uh, <laughs> but what I really want is them to not feel it's unfinished to feel wow. like I didn't I never knew that part of him or I didn't mm -hmm. know who he was or yeah. or he he didn't ever tell me he loved me or he didn't you know I mean uh, you know I know people and and even in our in extended family who you know they never really felt their father told them they loved them or they never yeah. felt. And and so I don't think that'll be the situation. And I, I, but I just I hope it doesn't feel unfinished. I always feel. Um, I feel like you know well, we have that a mutual friend who passed away early, you mm -hmm. know. And I was talking to somebody who worked with him, you know, was like a, you know, I think he was his mentor, you know, and and he said, well, he he told me this thing and it really hurt me and I don't know what to do with it. And mm -hmm. I was like, hey, if I could just step in here mm -hmm. as a guy who's a decade older than him. If he had lived, <laughs> I swear to you, one day he would have woken up and gone, yeah. why did I say that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. he would have called. So just let me mm. be him and tell you, I'm going to take this thorn out. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to take it with me because I, I knew him just like you knew him, and I don't believe that's what he meant. Yeah. And I don't yeah. know when you caught him, on what day, he hadn't had his caffeine or whatever was going on with his health, but... I don't want you to carry that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that it, whatever happens at the funeral, um, I'm a bit of a control freak, so that'll probably be planned already. Because <laughs> if somebody gets You'll up there and starts, uh, sometimes we'll go to funerals and I'll say to Jen, I swear to God, if this happens, I'm coming up out of that casket. <laughs> yep. I am not going to put up with this. And uh, so there are times where I'll say, but I, I want them to feel like it's okay if they're sad. but And I've said it to their face. If, you know, we've had losses just like everybody yeah. has. And, and so I've been on planes recently a lot for that. But I said to the guys, someday I will die. And it will not be a crisis in your life. Mm. It'll be perhaps sad or perhaps celebration. And they mm. always like whack, whack. And then I'll say, but, but it won't be a crisis because you'll know I love you. Mm. And you'll know what our, what our faith teaches us. And they'll decide how they're going to deal with that. But I think they believe that way. And and uh and we'll see each other again so i i just it was it wasn't talked about a lot in my family um and so i've tried to talk about it a little bit mm -hmm. in the sense of going i'm going to tell you this is out here and tell you you will be okay mm -hmm. that we have something else to hang yeah our hat on here and um and so anyway that's that's how i've approached it there's something so powerful about being able to talk about it I remember the first time my dad and I, I was back in, this when they were still living in Knoxville. And uh, we would go on these epic walks, me and dad, when I go home. And, and I just asked him, I was like, how do you feel about dying? And like, what do you think about it? And it was one of the most powerful like hours yeah. of my life, just hearing my dad. You know, it was super light, wasn't heavy. Mm -hmm. wasn't, and it was appropriate. It wasn't like he was joking, but it was just kind of, you know, Dave, I, I'm, I'm proud of my life. I feel and it was just some, like, it exhumed something in me that just felt like, huh, okay, that's mm -hmm. not, 
that's a beaut. I've never heard somebody say unfinished, but that's how I felt. I felt like that's one thing now I know. I have something to hold. Yeah, when it happens, yeah. it doesn't feel unfinished. There's not like. You hear people talk about when they've lost parents when they're young. Mm. And some of them become great writers. You think of Paul McCartney mm. and Lennon and, and um, you know, but but that seems to be what I hear is I never got to, I never knew about, yeah. I don't yeah. know who they are. Mm-hmm. When when they got to be in their late teens and the kind of the call of the blood, I want to know where I come from. I mm. want to know who I am. And they didn't have somebody there to answer that. Yeah. And so I think there's a, um, I think that's, uh, hopefully, you know, they'll feel that way about it. Because they've got Jen, and so Jen's really key to the whole game. Yeah. So, I mean, so she'll... He's back there making the I've snow noticed a, a really beautiful theme with these last two questions that we've asked almost all of our guests. And I didn't I, I, I didn't realize it until just, just now. But I think, for the most part, the answer to the first question is that I love them as they are. Mm-hmm. And the answer, for the most part, to the second question is, I hope that they say that they knew me. Wow. Sure. I think that's right. Barry, you're a legend. Thank you a this million times. This is so great, man. Thanks for having me do this. I'm thank sorry you, I talked so long. Dad, please.